Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Hello, my name is Karen Flushman. I am president of Loyola University's Black Alumni Association. I am so happy that you have decided to join us today. We have an amazing presentation for you. Um, and we have an incredible speaker, Dr. Byron um, Waller. He will be unmasking the dehumanization of Black people in the mental health therapy system. So we want to thank you so much for coming. I like to always start these presentations off with, again, thanking everyone, you know, and most of all, you know, thanking the people who have been involved in the uh, the actual execution of the presentation, you know, because, you know, as you get to the end of it, you know, you're running out of time and you forget to, to uh, thank the people who have been involved. Uh, so I'd like to thank uh, the Alumni Relations Department, uh, Paul, Paula, uh, Tim, and we've got Aaron on board as well. And then also Karen, uh, they've done a great job with working with us to put together the Black Life Seeker, Seeker Series. And we really want to thank them for you know, their continued support. We also want to thank our sponsor, who is uh, Paul Davidovich. Paul is the, the board sponsor, and he has done just an amazing job over you know, the last year, just kind of helping us navigate, um, you know, the university system and to connecting us to um, resources within the university. So we definitely want to thank Paul for his efforts. And, you know, we look forward to continuing to work with him. I also want to thank um, the board. And I have the fortune of being able to work with some amazing people, incredible, highly accomplished, uh, just really dedicated to Loyola's mission and dedicated to re-engaging Black alumni to the university and then also connecting you know, with Black students. So what I'd like to do is take a moment to really introduce you to you know, our board, you know, and it is expanding. Uh, so I'd like to start off first with uh, Sarita Yokely. And Sarita is our recording secretary, and she's been involved since the, um, since the very beginning, you know, at least of my leadership, you know, as president. She has done an amazing job of, you know, really keeping us official, if you will, keeping us on track you know, maintaining our documentation, ensuring that we have structure and, and um, a playbook, you know, so that the work that we're doing is not just for today, but it has the ability to be sustainable, you know, and to last long term. So we're really grateful for the work that, um, you know, Sarita has been doing. She has been, and she just, she has just been incredible in, in her role. And, um, just has she's done a great job and she provides and she brings credibility, you know, to the board, you know, from the very beginning. The next person here, we have a new member to our board and uh, it's uh, Rocky, uh, Rocky uh, Blackman and Rocky is our new member relations VP and Rocky actually, uh, she's a senior manager and she works for Amazon and she has some amazing ideas on how to connect or yeah, how to connect or reconnect uh, the alumni back to the university. So we're really looking forward to working with Rocky, you know, to execute, you know, on her plan. So she's an amazing addition to the group. Next we have Shakira Richard. Shakira um, has been involved in the board, you know, I since she graduated from Loyola, and she is a, uh, a two-time, um, she has two degrees from Loyola. Shakira is um, what I would consider an ideal person. She does an incredible job with the board in terms of helping us to, um, you know, come up with new and inventive ways, you know, on connecting with the uh, 
uh, with the, uh, the alums and mostly connecting with the students as well. Um, she's the VP of Student Relations. She's also a former um, president of the BCC and she has a, you know, an affinity for the students. She works for the Chicago Urban League and um, she is, she leads up uh, or heads up, I should say, uh, student development programs. Our next person on the board is our treasurer, Jay Yancey. And Jay is, um, as I said, the board is uh, unbelievable. It, you know, what we've been able to accomplish within the, uh, the last year can be said nothing, but it's been remarkable. It's been incredible what we've done. And so Jay, as our treasurer, uh, his role is, um, he is working with uh, the board and also with uh, uh, Dawn, and I'll talk more about that, you know, to really bring um, scholarships you know, to the black students, you know, within Loyola, you know, something that uh, we're very, very proud of. We look forward to developing, you know, a scholarship program. And at this time, Jay is leading that up. Jay has been involved, you know, for um, almost the entire time. You know, he's been just, uh, you know, an incredible resource for us, you know, really just making us, you know, think deeply and to, you know, really take our, you know, our programs to the next level. So again, just an, another incredible person that's on the board. Okay, so um, next we have Dawn and Dawn is our moderator today. And so um, I love to share more about Dawn um, and I'll do that shortly. So what I like to do here is to uh, talk to you about the Black Light Speaker Series. The Black Light Speaker Series was actually established as an idea from Shaikara. You know, she's our, she's one of our um, idea and innovative person. And she brought this, uh, having a speaker series up as something that the board should do. So we rallied around her and then Jay was the one that came up with the Black Life Speaker Series as the name for the speakers event. And so it's been a collaborative effort. You know, the entire board has been involved in it. You know, this is our flagship program, you know, within um, all of the programs that we're developing, you know, for the university and also for the students. So the name of Black Light, you know, it, the series is derived from the function of the Black Light. So the, fun the function of the black light is that it's designed to illuminate things that are hidden and not seen. And so when you think about um, a lot of the experience of black students at Loyola has been just that, you know, just having that feeling of, um, you know, attending the school, you know, but we have that feeling of be of not being seen and kind of hidden. So you know, the, uh, the connection was just right on point. So that's how we derived the name of the Black Life Speaker Series. So our goal and our purpose is to illuminate amazing alumni uh, so that not only that, the, that they have the opportunity to showcase, you know, their life's work, but to also help the university to see the amazing things that uh, their alumni are doing and how they're really changing the world. So we're, we're very excited to, again, it's all about reconnection. So our goal is to illuminate the life and the experience of Black, black uh, alums, you know, post-graduation and basically highlighting, you know, how they are carrying Loyola's mission and their vision and principles, you know, into the work that they do. Next, I'd like to, to introduce our amazing moderator. Um, Dawn came to the board um, and uh, kind of at the middle of last year. And she came on as um, VP of communications. And at the time, 
we talked a lot about social media, but we didn't have any resources to dedicate to social media. And so Don took that, uh, took that, um, that whole request of we need to be on social media and just uh, she just completely owned it, you know, her with uh, Shakira and together what they built is that we have a LinkedIn uh, group as well as a Facebook page and then Don has just some tremendous ideas on uh, different programmings for the alumni as well as the black students. So Dawn, just to give you a little bit more background about her, uh, Dawn is a visionary and she looks long-term. Not only is she managing the, uh, the communication, she's also will be, uh, will be VP of fundraising. And so I'd like to give you a little bit more information about her. She's a visionary and she's uh, a strategic advancement leader. She's a former Loyola uh, University. Not only she's a two-time graduate, but she's also a former employee. So her roots within Loyola are deep. Uh, it is her personal mission to amplify the stories of Black people and to connect the dots between history, contemporary issues, and the resources needed for Black empowerment. She has, uh, she is currently the Director of Advancement at University of Illinois in Champaign. She's also the founder and CEO of Napatulet Media, which is a digital media and marketing uh, firm specializing in programming and media empowerment for Black natural hair and black natural products. Dawn is, Dawn is the proud wife of a, uh, she's a proud wife and she has two children. She's also an alpha, uh, Kappa Alpha uh, sorority. She's a member of that sorority. She gives thanks and gives God the glory for allowing her to use her many, many talents to build the lives of others in her community. Don is an amazing person, just another asset to not only the university, you know, but uh, definitely to the board. And we are just so grateful to have her here. And she is gonna do an amazing job moderating the event. And so what I'd like to do is to um, introduce and to turn the meeting over to Don. Thank you so much, Karen. Wow, thank you for that wonderful introduction. And thank you for all that you do for the board. And hello everyone, thank you all for joining us today for this exciting session of the Black Light Speaker Series. The board and, and the staff and alumni relations have been so excited to put this together. And we know that you are really going to get a lot out of today's discussion. So as Karen mentioned earlier today, we are featuring Dr. Byron Waller, who is a PhD graduate of Loyola and he has a lot of insight about Black trauma, Black mental health, the importance of Black mental health. And we're just gonna give him the opportunity to share his expertise and what he knows with you all today. We will have a Q&A portion toward the end of today's session. And so please share with us your questions, comments about today's session, and hopefully you will be featured during that portion of today's program. Really quickly, I wanna go ahead and share with you Dr. Waller's amazing bio. So Dr. Byron Waller was born to a family on the west side of Chicago. He attended the Chicago Public Schools. While going to public school on the west side, he tested in Tulane Tech High School where he graduated. After high school, he attended Moody Bible Institute and earned an associate's degree in Christian education. He then completed his bachelor's degree from Grace College in psychology. After several years of working in the helping profession, he was able to gain employment at Chicago State University. While working there, he earned his master's degree in community counseling. After several years, he received the opportunity to teach psychology courses as he pursued entrance into a doctoral program. 
After applying to doctoral programs in counseling and psychology, he was accepted into the Loyola University Chicago doctoral program. Dr. Waller earned his doctoral degree from Loyola University Chicago in counseling psychology. He has been a counselor and counselor educator for more than 25 years. Along with teaching and training, Dr. Waller practices as a licensed clinical professional counselor, working with children, adolescents, adults, families, and couples. Dr. Waller continues to teach and train counselors to be effective and competent counselors. He primarily teaches and supervises in the clinical mental health concentration, but also in the counseling education and supervision doctoral program. Dr. Waller specializes in career development, international counseling, Christian counseling, spiritual counseling, multicultural, and Black issues. And without further ado, I want to give the floor over to Dr. Byron Waller. Dr. Waller, how are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you, Don, for that great uh, introduction. So thank you. Appreciate that. You know, it and I also, want to, I also want to thank you for inviting me during Black History Month. Although we know Black History is, is one month, but we know it's every month, not just one month. So thank you for that, the invitation. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Waller, you have the floor. I know that you would like to sort of give an opening statement before we get into our questions today. So please go right ahead. Thank you, Dawn. You know, during this Black History Month, it gives me the opportunity to do some things I normally don't do. You know, it gives me an opportunity to watch movies. So, and during Black History Month, certain movies come on that normally would not come. On. And I got a chance to watch the movie Roots you know, many haven't seen that, but in watching it, I saw how black people were treated. I saw Kuta Kinte was his name, but he was beat, beaten in order to lose his name and become Toby. Then I saw his daughter who was sold to another plantation and told the same day that the master will come in tonight and he's gonna rape you and he's gonna rape you until you have a child. Then I also saw how black men could not look into the faces of white men because if they did, they will be beaten. This is not only seen in the movie Roots, we also see movies of Birth of, Birth of a Nation, 12 Years of the Slave, where we're constantly seeing these ideas of oppression, the ideas of trauma and dehumanization. But this is even most seen in a more recent movie called uh, Judas and the Black Messiah. When you see this where black neighborhoods and people are constantly being occupied, where they were being oppressed and could not even live the things that they really wanted to. I mean, what was really significant about that movie that even the actor who played Judas in the movie had to go to therapy because he said, just all the oppression and those feelings from acting in that movie made him to become depressed. These are just only examples of what we as black people constantly have to deal with, being treated or perceived as less than because the color of our skin. This is traumatizing and exhausting. And we know that those types of things doesn't stop. They will immediately begin to impact our mental health. I have some statistics here that's really, really important to really talk about when we begin to talk about mental health in Black people. One thing that's very, very clear, mental health conditions occur the same between Black people and white people. They're about the same. However, Blacks are more likely than whites to report persistent symptoms of emotional distress. Blacks are less likely than whites to receive treatment for anxiety and mood. Blacks are more likely to be diagnosed with schizophrenia and, and not likely to be diagnosed with more emotional types of uh, diagnosis. Blacks are about twice as likely to be diagnosed with psychotic disorders and three times as likely to be hospitalized. Blacks are less likely to receive consistent care and Blacks are less likely to trust the healthcare system. These are just really examples of what Black people have had to deal with and the dehumanizing treatment that they constantly have to deal with in order to really live. So 
it's important that we see the context of mental health that is constantly dealing with oppression, racism, and mistreatment. This is really seen, and when we begin to talk about, remember the, the war on drugs, many people believe the war on drugs and remember that in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And during that time, black people were put in jail. Hundreds of thousands of black people put in jail. However, today, when white people have issues with drugs, they're not put in jail. All of a sudden, drugs is called a disease and that people need to go to treatment. That's really just one example of this unfair uh, treatment of mental health issues. And then of course it goes further. We can talk about the Tuskegee experiment. We can talk about Henry Hedda Lacks and all those situations in the healthcare system where black people have trusted the system and have been wrong and used and treated. So this is a context that we really have to really begin to look at when we begin to understand black mental health. Wow, what a powerful overview, Dr. Waller. And thank you for giving us some great context there in terms of just the long history of abuse and systemic mistreatment of black people. Um, so let's go ahead and go into our first question here. You've done a lot of great work in the area of Black mental health and therapy. Why did you choose this area to be the focus of your career and what inspires you to continue? Really good question. When I was in Bible school, I, you know, I felt like I had a calling to do this. I, you know, A lot of people wanted to be a, a pastor and all those other things, not me. I just felt like this was something where, where helping people psychologically was something that called me. And even after finishing, you know, my education, at least my bachelor's degree, I began to work with, you know, individuals who had disabilities, mental health issues, or mental illness. Also, this also with uh, criminal justice issues and really with those families with DCFS. Many of these families whose children were taken away from them. Not that they didn't do anything for, for that to happen, but just the feelings and the dealing with the idea of losing the children. You know, and so for me, those were just one of those things that called me to continue to do that. The inspiration that I experienced is really having an opportunity to actually train people who actually go out and do the things that I used to do. It's inspiring because now we know that other people are receiving that help so they can deal with the oppressive issues and really much of the systemic racism that continue to exist. Wow. Very, very powerful. And I'm glad that you decided to accept that calling. <laughs> so Dr. Waller, what are some of the reasons behind why Black people in general don't seek mental health therapy? So you mentioned earlier, there's a lot of mistrust within the Black community when it comes to trusting the system, right? The healthcare system specifically. Um, so please compare and contrast the differences between the Black therapy experience and mm -hmm. what happens of other ethnicities go to therapy. Um, sure. But let's start with, with the first part. So why are some of the reasons, what are some of the reasons that Black people in general don't seek mental health therapy? Believe it or not, there's a list of them. There's a list of why pe Black people don't want to go to therapy. Number one is that Black people perceive going to therapy as weakness. It's like you don't have the personal ability to sustain yourself. And now you have to go to somebody to help you. And so it's often seen as weakness and not strength. And so number two is because you look at the system and it's been dehumanizing. Why go to a system that dehumanizes you? So black people won't go because of that feeling of it, along with the mistrust. How can I trust someone you know, who continue to severely diagnosed me, who, se who severely sees me as less than. Um, and so that's really another reason why Black people don't go. A, a fourth reason is because there's a lack of multiculturally competent providers. That is so important. The truth is, no matter what anybody says, it's still the truth. Black people want to go to see a black person. Sure, they will go and see anyone for help, 
But if given the preference, they would go to see a black person because they feel as if there is a connection that happens pretty quickly. And so therefore they feel that there's a kindred spirit, you might say, and they will want to see a black person. However, there are not a lot of, of course, there's not a lot of black counselors and providers. But then there are also, when there's not a black person available, then there are not multiculturally competent counselors and psychologists so that they can understand many of these issues that we've been talking about in order to better serve the black community. And just a couple, another one, black people are private. Black people, I know all of us remember that rule, you keep everything within the family. Do not, your dirty laundry, you keep in the family, you don't go and talk to anybody except your pastor or your faith person. You go and talk to your pastor, but you will not go and talk to a health professional because that relationship has not been established and black people feel a, a lot more comfortable talking to someone who's right there with them, experiencing what they experience. And the final reason why I'll say there's this, this stigma for black people going to seek counseling is because a lot of black people don't have insurance. Sometimes it's just too expensive. And many times if I have to choose between going to therapy and paying the rent, guess which one I'm going to choose? I'm going to choose the rent. And so therefore these things continue on where there might be mental health issues and then they develop, may develop into mental illness. So there are a variety of reasons why black people do not use therapy or, um, or, or any counseling at all. Wow, Ooh, that's, that is really, really insightful. And you know, you've already given us some description of what the black therapy experience is like. Uh, mm -hmm. But give us some compare and contrast here. So, you know, when other people go to therapy, what does that look like versus what we experience as black people going to therapy? Yes, yes. It's really important to know, and there are statistics about this, that when black people go to therapy, they want some action, some movement, some, some improvement immediately. So if you, if you go into session and you just want to slowly just get to know the person, statistics tell us that black people don't come back. If they go and nothing happens, they're not returning. While other ethnicities may be okay with that process in which they will continue to, to, continue to come, but black people will not come. So that's really clear and how there might be differences between what the experience of a black person might be than experience of someone from other ethnicities. Wow. All right, so Dr. Waller, I know this is a very important point for you, but please explain the difference between mental health and mental illness. I know this is something yeah. you want to bring out. Yes, to me, that is really, really important because the idea of, the idea of really understanding what the similarities are, are really, really important. The truth is mental health is sort of this umbrella. It's the umbrella and where it's talking about how we function in our daily lives, you know, how productive we are, how we develop our healthy relationships, how we adapt to change and cope with issues and how we contribute to our community. So that is mental health. So it's that broad umbrella that really identifies all those things that helps us to function every day, okay? That includes not only, you know, this the functioning, but also emotionally, psychologically, socially, and spiritually. It helps us to be able to handle everyday stress and cope with life in that, in that way. So that's really more than mental health. And oftentimes, really a lot of the work that we do in this field, really don't focus a lot on the mental health piece. We focus more on the mental illness piece. And, and many times in your reading and research, you will find that mental health and mental illness are used interchangeably. And so a lot of our work is dealing with this idea of mental illness, which is really, really more of a medical and health condition. You know, it's, it involves changes in emotions, changes in thinking, and changes in behavior, all associated with distress. So in other words, 
the more distressed, the more evidence of mental illness we see and experience. So really, and then we began to look at the diagnosis of these distressed types of behavior, thinking and emotions. And really there's a, a, a categories of what these diagnosable disorders might look like. And we've seen that in the DSM-5, where we see all of this. And black people are diagnosed more severely than white people or any other people. So that difference where mental health is more of a broader and really look at a lot of the, some of the positive things in living and functioning. Well, mental illness primarily focuses on the negative things and which is more distressful. So there's a clear difference between the two. Thank you for breaking that down for us. That was very, very, uh, very helpful. So I know that you have studied the work of Dr. Joy DeGru, and yes. I'd like you to tell us about that. I, I've heard about her book, Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome. Yes. Um, the title is Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome, America's Legacy of Enduring Injury and Healing. How does her research influence your work? Boy, it influenced my work significantly in that Although these ideas are very controversial, people are like, no, that can't happen. However, when we begin to look at what happens to a people who are constantly under distress, who are constantly traumatized, who are constantly oppressed, dealing with all forms of racism throughout the years. You know, many people will say, well, slavery was 400 years ago. Well, what happens when you start looking at families who's constantly dealing with the, the, the experience of slavery. And that's what uh, Dr. DeGruy looks at. She looks at what are the consequences of these many years of, of racism and chattel slavery. And that she focuses on, many people will say that black people then are inherit, inherently and genetically inferior to white people. I say that again, genetically and inherently inferior to white people and do not look at the impact of oppression, racism over more than 400 years. And so she does. In fact, what she says is that what happens in having these experiences, you begin to look at the multi-generational trauma and oppression that black people deal with. The absence of the ability to actually heal from all the trauma and even having access to the society. And then she says really the evidence of what she identifies as post-traumatic slave syndrome. She says that really has really three patterns that really comes out of that. And that is vacant esteem and, and self-worth. Basically you see black people because of oppression, slavery and all these things, not having the self-worth, this this self-esteem and the belief in oneself and, and actually being more depressed because they have to deal with that every day. The second pattern she talks about is a marked propensity for violence and, and for anger, always feeling suspicious that something is going to happen, something negative is going to happen. So you live every moment on edge, ready for the next shoe to drop. And the third one she says is this idea of this racial socialization where you begin to hate yourself and hate everybody else who's like you. The self-hatred begins to become even more and more evident. And she says, and this is really some of the patterns that exist and you can follow it from slavery even into our present. And that's her idea. She's not talking about just really focusing just on the present, on the past. She's talking about understanding the past so we can impact the present. And she gave some examples of that. She says, you know, especially with our children, you have a, a black mother and she's out with her child. And I don't know many people who have grown up with black mother remember that talk. When you go out, don't say nothing. Don't ask for nothing, then you stay right next to me. And don't touch nothing. Don't touch nothing, exactly. And so that's, to, that's what we get, stay here. And that was really, really adaptive back then because the mothers have to protect their children. 
They cannot, they can be taken or they can be hurt. So as a result, it's like, no, you stay right next to me. And that is adaptive back then. But today, what impact does that have on our children? Our children stop exploring their environments. They don't go out there and begin to explore and see what's out there. There are many types of adaptive types of things that were back then, but today must change. A major one is we was told to be quiet, say nothing, and don't be seen. Keep your head down and just do what you have to do. We recognize today we can't do that. It's a lot of people still being quiet and saying nothing. We can't do that. We have to speak up and be seen. These are the type of things she talks about what has to happen from the impact of post-traumatic slave syndrome. And what she goes deeper, a lot more there, but that is just the basic ideas related to what her theory is all about. And it really helps me to really work with people and recognize we need to be able to, to encourage and, and increase self-esteem and self-worth. Wow, this, see, this is getting me fired up, Dr. Waller, because <laughs> it's made me realize even deeper how post-traumatic slave syndrome really affects how we as Black people navigate the world. And yes. that's the noticing the difference of how a Black person navigates the world versus mm -hmm. a person or someone of, of another culture or race navigates the world. You know, you, the, the differences are very, very visible if you sit down and look at it. I mean, I'm thinking right now of an example um, you know, I, I, I'm not going to bring it up, but there is a clear difference there. So thank you for mm -hmm. doing that with us, um, because it, it, it gives a lot of credence to the fact that the, the way we navigate the world is, is completely different and it needs to change. Yes, oh, definitely. And that's why we have to fight to remove systemic, institutional, uh, individual and structural racism. All this race, we have to remove it so that we as black people can live not under this oppressive, you know, a system. And we have to remove that so we can be as free as anybody else. Mm, I love that. So Dr. Waller, how do we as black people go forward? So what are some of the tools and resources that you recommend for us to overcome this negative impact of systemic racism on black mental health and therapy? Yes, yes. Well, first of all, I would say, encourage everybody, they really need to go to therapy. It is really, really important for everybody to realize just because you go to counseling or therapy does not mean that you are crazy. That really counseling and therapy can just be for life adjustment. I, you know, I'm trying to get here. I want to get here and I'm here. How do I get there? And oftentimes counseling and therapy can help you to do that. So I would suggest that everyone does that first, you know, that's number one. But number two, just as Dr. DeGruy talks about, we really have to be seen and we have to speak up. But then there are other, other organizations that begin to talk about other things, you know, like the Association of Black Psychologists. They have a couple of groups they call the Emotional Emancipation Group is where now you can have a group of black people and actually talk about those emotions and, and share with other people. And so you're not angry or, or you're not always on edge. So that's one of the groups that they suggest. Also, they suggest that we also have a culturally, a culturally rounded group where you can actually talk about cultural, cultural issues that impact you and how to deal with them appropriately. So there are, a, a, of organizations and groups out here that will help you know you to be able to deal with the impact of slave of racism and, and oppression and so but I, I would say and even in my private practice I, I see this as an important piece for people to be able to move to the next step in their own lives mm, all right thank you for that so dr waller based on everything that we've discussed today trauma due to slavery, systemic racism, mental illness, and mental health. We know that all of these things affect students as well. So how yes. can 
institutions like Loyola fully embody, well, Loyola specifically, fully embody its mission of cure personalis. So those of you who are familiar with Loyola's mission, that, that word probably rings a bell. So cure personalis is the Ignatian heritage of caring for the whole person. Yes. Um, how can Loyola fully embody cure personalis in an environment of critical reflection and sustained discernment towards Black students? Yes, yes. That's really, really so important that, you know, Loyola provides that, you know, actually has in his mission statement to be aware of treating the whole person. That is, is just fantastic. However, a couple of things can be done. Number one, I think is really important. We have to have more Black individuals in the room when, when decisions are being discussed and made. Where, where information can be shared and where people who, who can really uh, provide a perspective or information on helping Black people can be there. Also, having Black professors as role models, you know, there can be really helpful uh, at a university, predominantly white university, you know, where they can actually continue to get the information that they need. So that's number one. Number two, and I think Loyola is doing this, I do, that they're developing systems where if an individual is, is a black people who are, might encounter some barriers, they can have a place to go. The process, the system is set up where they know what they can do when they encounter those issues rather than not knowing what to do and feeling lost. No, there are systems set up particularly to help people to deal with that. And that's what Loyola can set up. And, and number three is, is, I think this is really important that Loyola admit a diversity of black students. Sure, sure, uh, admit the wealthy black person. Yes, admit the middle-class black person, but also admit individuals who are struggling, you know, who may be struggling academically or economically because in doing that, what it does, it gives a full range of who black people are and that, and that the university and, and the whole, and, and, and all people can experience who black people are. And so I think those are three things that really Loyola can do to help uh, uh, with, with black people in, in the US institution. Excellent, thank you, Dr. Waller. Sure. All right, everyone, so we have reached the Q and A portion of today's session. And so I'm going to welcome my colleague Shakira Richards onto the session and she is going to facilitate the Q&A. Thank you so much, Don. Thank you so much, Dr. Waller, for this awesome presentation and all this valuable information that you provided for us. Our audience seems to be really, really engaged in the conversation. So again, thank you so much for all of this information and these nuggets that you shared. We have a few questions um, on the table for you, but please let me start off and ask the first question. How can white people become our allies in unmasking and demolishing systemic racism from a therapeutic lens? Excellent, excellent, excellent question. That is an excellent question. And I, I, have, I have some suggestions that what can be done because I think this has been something that we've been talking about over the last year, especially as we dealt, dealt with, you know, we've gone on in the summer uh, and, and, and even till, until now, several things. One, white people have to recognize that becoming an ally is a process and takes time. It's not something where a person can say, well, I wanna be an ally and, and no, it's a process that really it takes in order to become uh, an ally for, for black people. One, I do think that the person have to educate yourself first. Educate yourself about who black people are. You know, whether that's taking a class, whether that's really reading up and doing research on what the issues that black people have, le learning what different types of uh, racism and oppression might looks like. You have to educate yourself in order. And, and, and this is important. Don't go to a black person to try to educate you, that's not their job. It's up to you to educate yourself 
And that's number one that it can be done. Number two, you can be, be present with black people. You know, join a black organization, be around black people. You know, we found I was looking uh, uh, on CNN a couple of years ago and they were talking about how even white people who live in neighborhoods with black people, all of their friends are white people. You know, they wanted, they moved to integrated neighborhood but they don't really integrate with black people. It is like, no, if you really want to be present with black people, you've got to get to know black people and develop those necessary relationships in order to become an ally. Uh, number three, I have a list of things that I've been thinking about. So, you know, number three, speak up. You know, sometimes a black person might need some support rather than just sit back, and, you know, and allow the situation to happen. Speak up and be supportive. You know, get involved, get engaged. Next one, believe what black people say. You know, believe what black people say about their experience, about what's going on, you know. Trust and under, try to understand it because it seems like black people can say something many, many years and no one ever believes it. And then all of a sudden, you know, a video comes out of something and then all of a sudden, oh, we believe you. I've been saying this for 300 years and now all of a sudden you believe me? Believe what black people say about their experience, you know? The five, get out your comfort zone. Get out your comfort zone. If you only want to hang around white people, you're not going to get the experience of who black people are. You know, you have to be able to challenge yourself, not just yourself and your family. You, you have to do that. And this one I see as really important. Be willing to go where black people are. Mm -hmm. You can't stay where you are. You have to go where black people are. And you have to go where black people cannot go. It's beautiful. When you, as a black person, when I say something to a black person, they're more often willing to believe me. But if I say something to a white person, the white person really often doubts. Mm -hmm. But if another white person says something that I say, the white person will be more willing to believe it. So therefore, take the things that you learn, go to your family. Keep, hold your friends and family accountable. That's something that you can do to demonstrate your, you know, you, that you want to be an ally. Be willing to pay the cost. You know, what's gonna happen is if you're gonna be an ally to black people, yeah, a lot of people are not gonna like that. They're not gonna like it. You have to be willing to pay the cost. It doesn't necessarily mean that, oh no, you, you're gonna be destroyed and your career gonna be destroyed, no. There's going to be some cost to it, and you got to be willing to do that because when you fight against white supremacy, there's going to be a cost against it. Then, again, a couple things learn about systemic racism, you know, use your privilege to help. Right. These are just some things that you can do as far as being an ally. Yeah, that's, that's good, Dr. Waller. Um, I'm taking it all in. I'm hearing you have to ask the question. You yes. Listen, actively listen. Yes. You have to believe what is being said. You yes. have to put yourself in that position and in that community to learn. And yes. all of these are just different stages of learning, what it sounds like to me, just basic learning skills. Mm -hmm. And then you also have to be able to risk or take a risk at your privilege being threatened. As yes. a white person, you're, you're challenging other people's thoughts. You're, mm -hmm. you're making and you're starting these uncomfortable conversations when you go back into your community and talk about what you've learned and what you've seen. And that might test your privilege and mm -hmm. your space. And so I, I really like what you said. Thank you, thank you for those steps. That's really good. So um, on to question number two. Okay. How does systemic racism, implicit bias, culture shock, and isolation on predominantly white campuses impact the mental bandwidth and or the mental health of black students on that campus? Mm -hmm. Mm, really excellent question. That's an excellent question. You know, um, in my private practice, I have an opportunity to work with uh, young black people who go to pre predominantly white institutions and then they come for counseling. And there are some things that really happen to all of them. Many of them, they feel like they go there and they feel isolated. Mm -hmm. 
They're not sure how to develop those relationships necessary in order to really be successful at a at white institution. And so there's a process that happens. They feel they don't develop any relationships. The next thing you know, they stop doing their, their, their work. They stop going to class and then they drop out because right. they feel really depressed as a result of feeling disconnected. And what has to happen here is opportunities for these black individuals to connect. That's why black organizations, organizations there are really so important. Mm -hmm. But also this idea that the university recognizes that for retention, something has to happen for the black students to feel connected to the university. Yes. Yeah. And one area that can really be helpful is for your residence assistants. For the RAs, first have some black residence assistants. So the person has somebody who can connect, they can connect to. And then also the residence assistants recognize that they need to be aware of some of those issues that many black um, individuals might have in feeling connected to university. Yeah. That's, that's really good. And those are actual like tangible steps that the university can take to kind of help with, you know, these different experiences of black students and different systems and also creating that exposure for other students. Because yes. as you said earlier, it's not all on the black student on the black person to be representative for the yes. entire race in the entire yeah. community. Yes. So um, actually placing black students in positions where they're exposed to other students and able yes. to curate these conversations, that's a step in the right direction and making sure that Loyola is ready to support those students. Because you yes. talked about diversity, diversification yeah. of students, those from those black students from privilege and those black students who don't come from that privilege and making sure that Loyola as an institution can best protect all of those students, those that come from privilege and those that don't come from privilege. They yes. have to be student ready just as much as a student has to be college ready. Yes. 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 Great. Good mm -hmm. job. This is really good information. So I'm going to keep on going for the sake of time. Mm -hmm. What do you suggest to therapists in and on methods they can take to become more culturally competent? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think one thing is to have first in school and in your experience, those are two separate things. In school, there needs to be some multicultural training. Particularly, they need to be training how to work with Black people, you know, because many people might have an idea what needs to be done, but really actually having learning in class and then actually applying that is really so important for anyone to be really successful in working with black people, you know? And I think that oftentimes we don't have enough, as I mentioned before, multiculturally competent individuals to work with, uh, with black people and so that they really be able to, to, to deal with some of the issues that they might have. Good. Thank you. Thank you for that. And then um, hopefully we can get one or two more questions in. Let's see, structurally, and I think you've kind of addressed some of this in your conversation. Structurally, what can be done to improve access to care in the mental health space? Specifically, mm -hmm. how can we impact mental health for our young people? And how can legislation be created to reimburse providers? and provide low cost benefits to patients. Yes, yes, yes. You know, that's, that's often one of those things that really makes it really, really difficult. First of all, let's remove the stigma so that going to counseling is not such a, a bad thing. And it doesn't have to be individual counseling. You know, it can be group counseling. Right. Where, uh, you know, where a variety of young people get together. It can also be family counseling where the family gets together. So let's not only focus just on one method that we can use, we can use a variety of methods. methods. So, so being able to provide those types of services are really, really important. Now, what the challenge is, is you're really getting paid for those services. Now, of course we have insurances who might, who, those who might have a PPO, they pay for that. But if you don't have a PPO, then the insurance company does not, uh, does not pay for that. So you have to, we have to figure out ways where community agencies will provide these services and they do 
And so we have to do more referral services of those agencies that provide these services for free or for very low cost. So it is possible. So if we can have some legislation that's, that, that sees the importance of what counseling and therapy can, can do and provide some monies for that. You know, yeah. it's great that Loyola has a counseling center. It, mm -hmm. It's fantastic that Loyola has a counseling center where students can actually go and receive counseling. But a lot of universities and colleges don't, don't have that. So we really have to look for legislation that will really provide these type of services to everyone who might go to any university. Okay, that's great. And you know what? We'll take one more question that I see. Um, it says, it appears that white people across the world have also been affected by post-slavery and constant negative images about Black people. Should this issue be addressed in schools through Black history classes and related discussions at institutions? And, and the answer to, from, from my perspective is yes, yes. But this is the difference. I think that when we talk about Black history, we tend to think about February. No, black people have been here in, in this country and in the world for many years. For, so therefore, when you talk about history, talk about it, including other people. Include, so you will see black people very differently when you recognize what we've accomplished throughout history, even when dealing with oppression, mm -hmm. that we have been a resilient and strong people. And I don't think many people even get a chance to hear those stories. Yeah. We need to make sure that those stories are heard and that they are seen. And so that will be really, so that the perception of who black people are can change. Now, finally, we need to be aware of what media says too. We need to be aware that uh, many actors are saying, well, you only wanna portray, I'm a black person. You only wanna portray me as the drug dealer, the gang banger. Right. You know, you don't want to betray me as the leader, as the scientist, as the person who also knows how to be a leader, you know? So those images must be challenged also, where we can see black people in a different way. Not black people see uh, people, black people in a different way and other ethnicities see black people in a different way. Because if we see the truth, I mean, even when you look at the board, you will see black people doing a variety of things and doing it at a high level. So it's yes. important that those things are clearly communicated. Thank you so much, Dr. Waller, for this Q&A portion. I appreciate your feedback and your response so much. And so I'm going to pass it back over to Dawn to close it out. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And you know what, Dr. Waller, just kind of like a heads up, we do have some clinicians on the call. And one of the questions that we didn't get um, into is, is there a database for clinicians to connect their patients with other, other culturally representative um, clinicians that are in the field. So just so you have a heads up. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shakira. And thank you, Dr. Waller, for being such a wealth of information today. I mean, what a powerful conversation. You've definitely given us a lot to think about and you've given us some tools that we can use as well. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you, Don. Absolutely. And thank you everyone for joining us today for today's Black Light Speaker Series session. Uh, I hope that you've gotten a lot out of today's session. We wanna let you know that we have another session coming up in April. So our next session will be on April 21st and we hope that you can join us. More details will be available very, very soon. And also you can find this recording of today's event uh, very soon. We'll be posting that on the university website and we will be sending out emails so that you can get access to that. And speaking of emails, we want you to join our email list. You can contact us via email at Loyola Black Alumni Board at gmail.com and you can ask to join the email list that way. And you can also join us in our LinkedIn group and you can also join us in our Facebook group. You could just do a search on both of those platforms for Loyola Black alumni, and you will find us there. Again, thank you everyone for joining us and we hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day.